Mmm, comics. Yo, yo, what's up, Comic Reading Universe? We meet again. It is I, your friendly neighborhood comic book reviewer, Steven Savelli from Hashtag Nerd Swag, and I'm bringing to you the staple stash for comics that were released on Wednesday, April 2nd, 2014. Today, finally, we have two DC comics that I read, and we got four Marvel comics. That's eight, but we're only doing four. We have no independent comics today, no image. I am Saudi. I need to catch up on black science. I will, I promise. All right, let's jump right into this. For the first comic we're gonna review today, it is DC Detective Comics number 30. As we know, this is a Batman comic. This is Icarus part one, um, so I jumped on at the new storyline. This is also a new creative team. So the creative team we got on this now is we have Francis Manipal, Manipal and Brian, uh, Bucciolato, 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 one of those two. <laughs> anyway, this was the creative team that was on the Flash comic recently that everybody was raving about. They've hopped over to, the de to Detective Comics, um, and hopefully they can uh, get on par with Scott Snyder's Batman. So what we have here is, uh, yeah, like I said, Icarus Part 1, um, and this is a reimagining or... or uh, Rejumping on point for for detective comics man does a new creative team slay it on this one there's some beautiful beautiful art and panel layouts they really 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 hone into batman's movements um and batman's obviously creepy darkness um but they do it using bright colors there's lots of bright yellows lots of bright pinks lots of bright purples bright blues um it's cool to see really um, bright colors like, you know, oranges as well, um, used to create a dark comic. Um, really cool contrast there, and uh, I'm really digging the art on this. The writing is marvelous as well. So what they got going on here is we have Bruce who's talking to Elena Aguilar, um, who has a daughter, Annie, um, which she's kind of using as a reference um, to Damien, um, we have we have Eleanor with her daughter Annie and Bruce bringing up Damien, and later in the comic talking about him. But <clears throat> we have Bruce talking to Elena, and what she's trying to do is get help from Bruce and get money and funding for him for her Aguilar Healthy Families Initiative. And what she's trying to do is save the East Side of Gotham. Um, we see at the beginning of the comic Batman in the East Side of Gotham, um, cracking down on some bad folks um and as we see the chase of him chasing down these bad people we see bruce we cut over to bruce obviously not at the same time different time bruce talking to elena um and basically saying he's gonna give his money to her foundation to help clean up the east side of gotham this makes some people angry and what do they do they send people out to ruin this plan because the east side of Gotham is where they're getting their money for their evil endeavors. Um, so towards the end of this book, we see something happen to Elena because people are not happy about her teaming with Bruce to clean up the east side of Gotham. Um, but something happens right before the end of the book that is the reason why you should pick this up and it should draw you in. We have Bruce in a really sad moment um, fixing Damien's bike as we know Damien is no longer living which is Bruce's son um, he was a Robin for those who don't know uh, Damien dies and uh, Bruce is here talking to Alfred um, trying to fix up Damien's bike because before Damien left Bruce had promised to fix it um, and uh, we see a really it's a pretty sad scene um, and a very gripping scene. And it shows that we got Francis here and Brian that really know how to tell a good story of, of um, Bruce and Batman um, and bring the heart right into this first issue of Icarus part one. Um, really great stuff. I'll give the writing on this book a solid eight and I'll give the art a nine. Um, switching over to a 10 point scale to give a little more point fives and a little more precise grading. So we got the writing as an eight, the art as a nine. That would give an overall 8.5. This is a really, really solid book. I am happy that I'm 
jumping on to a detective comics or even just a Batman book in general, um, got some lucky timing that I wanted to start reading them again as soon as a brand new creative team hopped on and it, man, did they surprise me. I haven't read any of their comics before, um, but the hype is real. Uh, I saw people online um, discussing previews of this book about how it was going to match up to Scott Snyder's, if not surpass it. And after reading it, they got me. I'm going to start reading this Detective Comics book um, for the near future. Good stuff. All right, next up for DC, we have Aquaman and the Others, number one. This is the first issue for that. It's written by Dan Jurgens with art by Lan Medina. Um, who Aquaman and the Others are, if you haven't been reading any Aquaman books, um, Aquaman's solo run of the New 52 that was written by Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns introduced the Others, which was this team of people that have helped Aquaman in the past. They're kind of like... Aquaman's own Justice League well not Justice League his own team um but I like using League because he's in DC so it's Aquaman's own League of got of people they're called the others there's four there's four others um that work with Aquaman so we have Aquaman the prisoner of war the operative Sky Alkase and Yawara and these people are from all walks of life um we have Sky Alkase who's Native American um, I don't want to go over their powers because I really think you should pick up this comic. Um, I know Aquaman's, a lot of people aren't uh, digging him, but I think since the New 52, he's been one of the most intriguing Justice League members there is. Um, like I said, his solo run by Jeff Johns all the way up past the Throne of Atlantis to about issue 21 is some of the best stuff that the New 52 had to offer. Um, so I need you guys to pick up this book. I'm not going to tell you... <laughs> too much about the others except for their name uh so we have the prisoner of war who was an old military um person who um yeah is one of the others i was about to say his special power or whatnot but we have the prisoner of war old military guy we have the operative who kind of looks like um uh he kind of looks like tom clancy style secret agent guy um He's an older fella, and he's the he actually owns a plane where they have the the others as base, and they call where they meet the living room, which is kind of funny because they're on a plane, but he lives on the plane um, and travels the world, um, so they call their meeting room the living room. Pretty sweet. So we have the operative, we have Sky Alcase, like I said, is a, a native Native American character, and we have Yawara, who's from the jungle, um, and she has had a slight romantic past with Aquaman. So we got Aquaman, the Prisoner of War, the Operative, Sky Alkase, and Yawara, who are all part of the others. And the, re the reason why this new run is starting is right now they all five of them have an artifact um, from Atlantis. Of course, we know Aquaman has the trident, um, but all the others have their own artifact that they wear that gives them even more um, powers. Um, and that's what ties them all to Aquaman. Uh, so all the these Atlantis artifacts were founded by Atlon, the guy that founded Atlantis. Um, and the whole idea of this book, it's really an introduction to these characters. So we see each one of them being attacked by people that won all these artifacts. Kind of your stereotypical superhero origin, we'll, we'll say origin book for the others. Um, just introduces them all. You get like this quick little background and they all get attacked and the end of this book is in meeting trying to find out why they're being attacked uh this actually isn't a great book um especially for me who's read the aquaman series so i already knew who these characters were i didn't need an introduction um so i would give the writing on this a five and the art is six but even though i'm scoring this kind of low for the writing and art i actually my overall feeling of this book was i loved it i was familiar with these characters um, and I like where it's going and I've liked what I've seen in the past and Dan Jurgens, I feel like has a good feel for Aquaman and these, and these people. So I think this is a hot read. Actually. I think as time goes on, this book is going to be really solid. All right. Next up, we're going to hop over to Marvel for this week. And I got four comics. We're going to start with the one that I had the funnest time reading. And that is Loki 
Agent of Asgard, number three. This is um, this book has writing by Al Ewing and art by Lee Garbett. <laughs> the first issue I loved. The second issue, um, Loki was doing speed dating, um, and he was trying to find Lorelai from Asgard, and I just really wasn't feeling it. But this issue of Loki, Agent of Asgard, has got me back on to this book. If you're not reading Loki, Agent of Asgard, Loki's trying to be a good guy. He's trying to do things for the All-Mother. And by doing these missions for her, he's hoping to take off some of the things he's done from his history um, and try to clean his slate. Um, which means he'd have to do a lot of missions because Loki's done a lot of terrible things. But Loki died and has been reborn kind of as a good well we'll do we'll use these he's been reborn as a good guy um we'll see if he really is but there's an old loki so we got two lokis in this book there's an older form of loki the nefarious loki that's still out to be evil and in this book we kind of get it's kind of a fairy tale type of book we have the evil nefarious loki going back in time and really um using odin when Odin was a kid as a pawn to do an evil, evil thing and uh, create himself a powerful weapon that he can use in the future. Um, not too much to go on about this book, but this book is fun. This book is funny. This book is creative and it is um, a fast paced, exciting book. I, I never thought I would like a campy Loki Agent of Asgard book. I felt like they were just making this book for fans of the movie, of the movies of Thor. But this is actually turning out to be a pretty good little run, and I would highly recommend it. So I'd give the writing on this a seven, and I would give the the art on this a seven as well. There's not a lot of creative panel layouts, and the writing's not like this this immense drama with all these different layers. But it is freaking fun as crap to read. Um, my favorite Marvel book of the week, for sure. Um, and I'm not a guy who likes these kind of books either. I like the dramatic, dark, um, human emotion stories. <laughs> and this just had me smiling the whole time, and I've, I loved every minute of it. All right, next up, we have the biggest event in the no in the known near future and that is inhuman number one from marvel uh, i use that voice because i feel like they've hyped this up like monster truck videos you know the monster truck commercials you see on tv anyways i feel like marvel's been hype, hyping this up and we've had creator changes and this book will never live up to the hype that marvel has given it on the cover, it says Marvel's latest epic begins here. No. I'm pretty sure Original Sin starts really soon, and that's written by Jason Aaron, and that book is going to crap on the sales of Inhuman. The writing's going to be better. The art's going to be better. Um, I give this book and the writing a 4 out of 10, and I give the art in this book a four out of 10, maybe a five out of 10. I'm reading New Avengers, which has really got me back into this inhuman story, uh, the inhuman people. Um, Black Bolt is a super cool character in the New Avengers. And like I said last week, I really liked the Infinity run and I liked what Infinity had to give and uh, what it had to do for the Terrigen Mist spreading out in the world where Black Bolt destroys um, his city and spreads the Terrigen mist. And this is the pickup of that, of how that mist is going out and taking people and turning them into Inhumans. If you don't know who the Inhumans are, basically the Kree came to planet Earth way, way back in the day, prehistoric times, well, not prehistoric, <laughs> went back in the day when humans were a brand new species and basically um, did experiments on humans. So the Kree's aliens came down mess with these humans uh, those humans are called the inhuman because they have special abilities that the Kree gave them when they mess with their DNA um, over time the inhumans have kind of sparse sparsed out and there's not very many of them very many of them left on earth and those that are inhumans aren't activated in humans they are 
dormant. Um, and what happens is this Terrigen mist, like I said, that, that black bolt sent out in the end of um, Infinity, goes out and lands on a big, large amount of the population. And those that are inhuman, it sets off the trigger in their DNA to give them their powers. Um, so this brings us at number one, where people are getting their powers. We, we see three people in this comic get their powers. Um, and we have the villain here, who's an inhuman that doesn't think there should be inhu more inhumans because he likes to run the town on the inhumans. His name is Lash. He's a cool looking character, super, super stereotypical one dimension villain. Um, he's going around killing all these new inhumans because he wants the population to be small so he can control them. Uh, he doesn't believe Black Bolt's his king and uh, Queen Medusa, he doesn't follow her a lot either. Um, <sighs> you couldn't get a more stereotypical uh, start to a series. Um, Charles Soule, who's been doing some really good writing, this is, this is, I don't want to say it's garbage or trash, but I will say it's bad. And I was looking forward to this for a few months because, um, you know, I believed a little bit in the hype and I liked Infinity and I liked the Inhumans premise, but uh, not really feeling this at all. Like I said, a four on the writing and it probably is worse than that. And I'm just being a little biased because I like the idea of the Inhumans and I like Black Bolt and the Illuminati and New Avengers and yeah, pretty bad. Next up this week, we have Moon Knight number two. Um, this is written by Warren Ellis with art Decl by Declan Shalvey. This book is the second issue to what some were calling was the best number one in a really long time with Moon Knight number one. Um, it was super cool to see uh, Moon Knight, Mark Spector, back in comics with his, with his new number one. He was in his white suit looking super cool. This comic is kind of a one shot. Like you don't need to read the first comic and it doesn't really set up the third comic. Of course it does a little, but you could almost skip this entirely. With that being said, this was awesome. I I'm really digging Moon Knight. I mean, he's he's not, but he is kind of like Marvel's own Batman. Uh, he throws his little moon discs. He's got a little moon uh, plane <laughs> that looks like uh, the bat plane. And he's got a Batman feel to him for sure. Um, so he's cool to write and he's cool to, to read. I really, I really like this. Um, the art and panel layout that we have here that Warren Ellis and DeClan Shelby did is pretty, pretty sweet. And uh, it starts off... Um, with a bunch of random people and you have no idea why you're seeing these people and they all end up getting killed and we find out in this book um, why they were killed and the consequences uh, of that happening um, we have Mark Spector as Moon Knight basically chasing a guy down who who gunned down this group of people and he, he wants to get to the bottom of why he's going around sniping and killing these random people Mark Spector does get to the bottom of it at the very end of this book. The cliffhanger is kind of lame, kind of whack, um, but the it was fun. It was definitely a fun read, and seeing Moon Knight back in some panels is pretty cool. So I'd give the writing on this a 7, and I would give the art actually a 9. I really like the art in this. I love how Moon Knight is all in black and white with some... with uh, very 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 little shading it's really cool no matter the lighting of the room he's always in black and white with shading i really like that effect that they got going on here so i really like the art and the writing is good too it, it uh, is a fluid comic there's not a lot of questions that come up like why is this happening i don't get what's happening um why are we telling this story it's just that this could be skipped entirely and you would be just fine going from issue one to probably issue number three yeah, a little disappointed. Actually, very disappointed about this Moon Knight comic. All right, last up this week for Marvel Comics, we have Ultimate Spider-Man number 200. Of course, we all know this is written by Brian Michael Bendis. He has been writing this Ultimate Spider-Man comic for 15 years. 15 years. He has written 200 issues of Ultimate Spider-Man. That is crazy from peter parker to miles morales and everything in between um brian michael bendis has written this this was an extra large issue i think it was 
yeah, $4.99. Um, since she was $4.99. We have art. I need to look at that on my list because this is a list of people. We have art on this comic by Dave Marquez, David LaFuente, Sarah Pacelli, Mark Brooks, Mark Barley, and Andrew Hennessy. Um, all did penciling and art on this comic. This is a this is a celebration of Peter Parker. Um, this comic is Aunt May bringing peop- all the people that were close to Peter Parker, um, bringing them to her house, and they all give their stories and history about Peter Parker. Um, this is a really touching book. Uh, it's cool for people who haven't read, read a lot of the ultimate comic Peter Parker story um, or or S- Peter Parker Spider-Man in general, if they've just been reading this new Miles Morales um, Spider-Man. It gives a really, really cool history of all this stuff um, that he's done and they've used uh, Brian Michael Bendis in this story, used a lot of cool characters like Iceman and Firestar to tell some history of, of uh, things they did with spider or not can't say spider-man things they did with peter parker and what they remembered about him and this was just a man this was a tearjerker this was a really good book um it ends with a cool cliffhanger um this is going to the to miles morales's new number one ultimate comic and we know that that peter parker is coming back as spider-man um i think by the end of april the last week of april we'll have spider-man uh, I'm not sure there's there's a word before Spider-Man. Maybe it's the Amazing Spider-Man number one again. But we do have Peter Parker coming back soon. So it was cool for them to end um, this Ultimate Spider-Man run on number 200 um, with all these artists that have work on, worked on it and all these people who are close to Peter Parker's Spider-Man talking about his past. And it really does set, it really is the finality of this story. Um, and, the, and Brian Michael Bendis does it in a very, very classy in very well done way. Um, I don't, there's not too much to say about it. You kind of have to read it to enjoy it. There's uh, there's amazing splash pages that they do. Um, a splash page, for those who don't know, is the when you open it up, uh, when you're actually reading a real comic, and you open it up and both pages make one big picture. Um, I think there's like three or four big splash pages in here where you see like the Avengers, and then you see all the different spider-man suits some um, and different vehicles he was in and stuff like that so there's some really awesome splash pages so the art i would give a nine i'd be i could be convinced to give the art a 10 out of 10 and i'm gonna give the writing a 10 on a 10 from start to finish this comic book was impeccable it was perfect and if you are a spider-man fan whether peter parker doc ock spidey miles morales anything if you are a fan of spider-man if you ever have been or you ever will be um you should go and buy this comic you should have it this is something you need on your shelf it doesn't matter if you've read any of the other ultimate spider-man comics this is one you have to have in your library on your shelf um you pull it out whenever you want it's just a sweet read from start to finish um this is a big event in Spider-Man history, Peter Park history, and it sets up Miles Morales' new Spider-Man run, and it sets up Peter Parker coming back as Spider-Man. Pretty damn key issue for Marvel um, Comics. So yeah, that's it for this week for, for DC and Marvel. Like I said, no Image Comics this week. Um, I'll be looking to pick up some more independent comics. I'm trying to catch up on The Walking Dead. I started back at issue number one a few weeks ago, and I am obviously... 100 issues behind but i will try to catch up um that way i can start reviewing the walking dead i know a lot of readers are big fans of that um and speaking of big fans of comics i want to do something new this this weekend uh since it's the beginning of a new month i'm going to run over the sales for march 2014 just so you as viewers know um who is um the highest seller in comics um out of the big two and also which comics are being bought the most of uh so real quick in March, we have Marvel, who is the number one seller of comics. Um, this this uh, data was released by Diamond Comics, who's a distributor for basically all the comics you see on shelves. Marvel claimed the number one spot with 34% of the sales. DC was second with about 26% of the sales. We have Image coming in third with 11.4. Image Comics, almost doing catching up to about half of what DC's doing. 
to me, that is, that is unreal. I can't believe, um, how much in sales image is doing. I believe it as a reader because as you guys know, I love deadly class and I know a lot of people love black science, um, the walking dead, stuff like that. Uh, but image picking it back up and surprisingly, a lot of people still buy spawn. I don't know why I believe that is the, well, obviously not the worst comic on shelves. We have the little pony and stuff like that, but it's a pretty bad comic. So we got Marvel number one with 34 DC at number two with 26 image in the third spot at 11%. All the other small um, independent comics uh, aren't on the list. All right, now we just do the top 10 selling comics for March. This is very interesting. We have DC in the one, two, three, and four spot. So they had the top four individual issue sales um, in the top 10, but they were number two in overall sales because Marvel has a lot of smaller books that all add up to more. The number one book in sales for March was Batman number 29, number two was Superman Unchained number six, number three was Forever Evil number six, number four was Sandman Overture number two. That's a DC title that not a lot of people know about and we, um, I'm gonna start picking that one up. Number five, we have Superior Spider-Man number 29 by Marvel. Number six, we have Daredevil number one by Marvel. As you guys know, I love Daredevil. Reviewed it next uh, last week, issue number one, and it was pretty dang awesome. Number seven spot, we have Superior Spider-Man number 30. So we have Superior Spider-Man 29 and 30 in the five and seven spot for Marvel. Number eight, we have Silver Surfer number one. Very surprising. Number nine, we have The Walking Dead number 124, which is by Image Comics, of course. And number 10, we have Uncanny X-Men number 19 point now, which I reviewed last week, um, coming in the number 10 spot. So we had four DC, we had five Marvel, and one Image in the top 10 in sales for March. Anyways, comic book world, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoy your comics. Go out, buy Loki, Agent of Asgard number three, buy Detective Comics number 30, and buy Ultimate Spider-Man number 200. Until next time, I will see you guys later.